Uh, my name is Greg. Hi, Greg. I don't know if it's working, but you can hear me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it's an observation as, as much as a question. It's a known supposed fact that um, high levels of stress can cause sleep disorders in people. Mm -hmm. Another one I've heard more recently is that people suffering severe financial loss um, experience a um, high, heightened um, <clears throat> incidence of death uh, thereafter. Uh, well, there was the great crash, you know, the stock market crash yeah, way back. Yeah, so, yeah. so can you connect those two? Neurobiology and your form of science is new to me. So I'm just l searching for some connection here between these two. Right. So um, if, I, the, if the, the question is, uh, is there a connection between this? You talk about sleep problems. Well, the right. stress, uh, stress, is a, stress is a commonality yeah. between those two examples. Yeah. So um, here's the thing. Uh, everybody heard the question? Yeah. Um, the thing is this. Stress, as we like to say, isn't so much something that happens to us. It's what we do to ourselves. Do you Dis with me? Disagreed. Right. Right. I, 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 you, you can. Right. <laughs> I'm about to say something smart, Alec, but I'm not going to. I could take it. Okay. Because here's the thing. Um, uh, stress, uh, we, we like to talk about it as something that's being foisted upon us. Something that happens to me. But it's important to know that, and this gets back to our notion of who we are as storytellers. Um, we could talk an awful lot about this, but one of the things that we're doing all day, every day, is that we are trying to make sense of what we sense. We like to say that the brain operates bottom to top and right to left. Right? Spinal cord, limbic circuitry, prefrontal, and then eventually right hemisphere, left hemisphere, prefrontal cortex. And we are eventually making sense of what we sense, and we're doing that all the time. And so the thing that we call stress happens to become our growing awareness of whatever it is that we think that we have to do. Would that be fair to say? We've got things to get done, things like I've got the, the, the reality that I'm going to lose my job, all those kinds of things. There's a thing called government regulators, yeah. Okay. $10,000 well, right. fines, yeah. Right. <laughs> Okay, exactly. But my, but my point is that what we do with that incoming stuff is how stress emerges. Stress does not happen to us. Stress emerges as a function of what we do in response to what we sense and image and feel and think. It is an act that we actively participate in, but that we often aren't aware that we're doing. Now, here's the, something else that we will say. Um, the brain, more than anything else, the brain can do lots of hard work. And by hard work, I don't just mean math computation. I mean the brain is capable of tolerating lots of distress, but the thing that it doesn't tolerate very well is being alone. And it is in our states of perceptually being alone being in states where we don't feel understood or that my life is very well understood by somebody else, that my anxiety rises. Anxiety in the brain primarily is not just about danger per se. It is about my perceived sense of being in the presence of danger while I have nothing that I can do while I am by myself in the process. Jim Cohn's work at UVA demonstrates this powerfully when he looks at what happens to stress to people who are individuals compared to what happens to those same individuals when they are connected physically to a loved one or a close friend. And so what I would say about this, this gets back to the very notion of community. That our answer to stress is not just to somehow magically make stress go away, although there are certain things that we do. So for instance, I'm not a Luddite, but I will tell you that our technology is not helping our distress. Because one of the things our technology is doing is that it is actively distancing us from other people in terms of deeply connected human relationships. Um, I was going to include this. I didn't. So in January of 2017, you may have seen this, that uh, the United Kingdom instituted the new Ministry of Loneliness. They have a minister for loneliness. Mr. Lonely. <laughs> so, but, but think about it. We and now have a government that has recognized that the notion of loneliness is a big enough deal that we need to do something about it. I got to tell you, like, no government is going to do anything about this. Because 
This is not a new human problem. It's just become one that is so big that we're finally recognizing it at that level. This is a problem that begins, we would say, with the beginning of mankind. And so when it comes to stress, there's deep connection between stress and shame because my sense of shame is deeply connected to community and whether or not I am in a community of people by whom I'm deeply known. And the degree to which I think that no matter what happens to me, I'm not going to be left alone in that process. If I'm in debt, if I'm out of my job, if my health concerns raise, so forth and so on. Stress is primarily a function of our relative level of connection with others. Thanks. Hi, my name is Art. I'm a student here. Hi, Art. JMU. Um, I'm interested in how communities create shame and maybe how we, maybe as communities, don't realize that we're doing that, maybe unconsciously. Right. So how do communities create shame and how does that perhaps happen and get created in ways that we don't know, that we're not conscious of? Um, well, the first thing I would say is that, um, you know, shame tends to beget itself. This is one of the other features of it, right? When we feel shame, if you notice, when you feel shame, then you feel shame for feeling shame. You, ever, you, you notice that, right? So imagine if we um, do that on a community-wide basis. Does that make sense? Think about that for a second. If we do that on a community-wide basis, then what we find is that if we feel shame as a collective community, we will then tend to do things often non-consciously. We're, like, we're not waking up in the morning and saying, gosh, we all want to feel worse by the end of the day. We're not waking up trying to say that, but we end up doing things defensively that actually do reinforce the shame. So, for instance, um, uh, one thing that communities can do within themselves is um, we'll, we'll talk about certain uh, kinds of thoughts or behaviors and so forth in which, again, the process in which a person is experiencing something is like if, if they feel something or think something and so forth and so on, it's not so much about what I think or what I feel. It's going to be that nonverbal disconnection of relationship that happens in the discourse that I have about whatever the topic is. Does that make sense? And so um, one of the major questions that we have, I mean, all we have to do is take a look at American politics, right? We have a difficulty on the American political scene because for the most part, people really have a hard time being in the same room with one another without using shaming behaviors as ways to communicate. Does that make sense? All right, we're all kind of like shaking your head because like we all know, all right? But here's the thing. The reason that we're kind of left with those being the only behaviors is because we feel it so much. Shamed we shame people out of our states of shame. We don't like, we're not, it's not like we're healthy people and we just decide, I'm going to shame that person. No, I shame, so if I'm in the business of shaming other people, I first have to recognize where is it within me? What is it about the story that I'm telling? What is it about my deep sense of I'm not enough, I'm not okay? What is it about that story and where is that coming from? Out of which is emerging this thing that I'm doing in the context of my community. Does that make sense? Here's the other thing, though. When you have entire communities that are being formed by shame, if you're going to approach that problem, you're going to need another community to do it. Mm. You can't take these things on as an individual, per se. So I have some friends who work for um, International Justice Mission, IJM, and they're doing work on human trafficking. I want to assure you, human trafficking is all about shame. I mean, it's about the business of you know, trafficking and shame in many respects. The reason that you need an IJM is because one individual can't take that on. Does that make sense? And so we ask each other in communities, uh, one of the first things that we say um, in, the, in these groups that we work with, one of the first ways that we really help people start to heal this process is by sim simply, first of all, beginning to invite them to tell their own personal story. You see, shame isn't just something that we experience it's as an abstraction. It is always contextualized in the context of our own personal story. For Steve, he didn't just have shame. He had shame that was embedded in a real story that he had to tell, that he had told no one. And because he walks around with this particular story, he's also having to walk around managing the neural network payload that that story represents 
And as long as he continues to have to manage that, on top of which now is the shame of not being able to stop his son's suicide, at some point, his brain no longer has energy to do its normal daily things, and he gets depressed. In communities, as we begin to tell the story of what our real vulnerable experiences are, we eliminate the possibility for shame to have a space to breathe. Shame does not want you to be vulnerable because shame knows that the moment that you're vulnerable, the moment that you're vulnerable, somebody else might actually look across the room and be empathic. And if you're empathic, it gives you the opportunity for healing because your brain is now deeply connected to somebody else's brain. Does that make sense? Healing begins primarily, first and foremost, by someone connecting to the parts about you that feel like the parts you hate the most. I don't know if that's helpful. That's good. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, part of what I was interested in as well is like societal norms as something that can create uh, maybe, right, having groups that are maybe dominant and having maybe somebody in the LGBTQ community feeling shame because they don't fit in mm -hmm. um, and how maybe we don't think that just our... Um, our norms can create, uh, allow us maybe to put the shame on people. Right. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, it's, it's like this. Um, uh, when we, and, and again, when we often, you know, the, the language of sociology, the language of sociology is interesting because when we, it's easy for us to talk about norms as if these things are like these things that exist apart from actual real interpersonal interactions. There are no such thing as norms. Now, you must like a... That's just, like, just, that's just true. Of course there are norms. Like, no, we use the word norms as a way for us to talk about large collections of individual interactions, right? So if someone from a particular group of people or some one person has a particular experience that they want to talk about, the real question is not just like, do they, are, are they able to be accepted? Like, I don't know what that means apart from the actual interaction that I have in real time and space with them. Are they able to tell me their story? And am I able to be empathic with where they are? Does that make sense? And, the, and, and, and here's the thing. Um, this, is the other, this is the other tricky thing about culture at large. And this is true across the board. This is outside the scope of faith or anything else. We live in a culture that is increasingly unable to recognize the reality that if I have a felt need and you say no to my need and I don't feel understood, I'm only going to feel completely understood if I get my need met the way I want it met. Are you with me? And, that's di and, and so we, this, this is actually back to parenting 101. Because there are many times when parents have to say to children, I know that you want this and I know that it's really hard because you want that but you can't have that. That's really, that's really, and, I, and to say to your child, like, this is really tough. This is really tough. It, and it honestly really is. What your kid needs more than your kid needs the baseball glove or the glass of juice or whatever, what your kid needs more is to know that at the end of the day, whether they get what they want or not, they don't lose you. That's what we need. Does that make sense? And so the question of whether or not I'm actually able to be empathic and seriously maintaining connection with you, this is about the clutch in the engine. It is whether or not I'm able to be main to intentionally maintaining connection with you come hell or high water is really where shame exists. It's not in the end just about the yes or the no. It's about whether or not I'm actually able to maintain connection. And that's hard to do because we don't have a lot of models for that. Right? And, and, and it, you know, politics doesn't give us a lot of models for that either. That's hard. Yeah. Hi, my name is Nate. I'm not sure if you said this or I just missed it, but could you give a concise, well, as concise as you can make it, a working definition of the term shame? Because I've heard it so much, it's sort of losing its meaning, or I think of something, other people think of different things when they hear the word. Yeah, no, I can't. <laughs> Um, I, let, let me just say, I, I, did not, I did not give a working definition. What I gave was a description. And I think the description really is, uh, what, what I want to give is that, is that metaphor of, of, the, of the automobile, that, that description. And, 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 and so I, I gave you some descriptors around it. 
I'm not giving it a definition per se, primarily because, and, and just think about this, it is not an abstract thing to be known, it is a physiologic thing to be experienced. Does that make sense? And you see, part of our challenge living in a mo like modernist, postmodernist world, this Cartesian dualistic world, is that we've kind of run into trouble um, wanting to have definitions for things, because if I know that I know that I know what that is, then I can package and wrap it. I can know when I'm like, I'm controlling it. And, 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 and look, like we're doing this for good reasons. I mean, it's not like, well, we, you know, we're just trying to be control freaks. No, we're doing this for good reason. We're really trying to do the best we, because look, we all want a world of goodness and beauty. The problem is that like, there, you know, th this is what quantum mechanics has taught us. That there is no such thing as certainty. And we hate that. There is probability. There is predictability. But I can't know for sure that I can know for sure. And all I'm left with is trust. What I'm left with is that I'm going to be in a world where I actually need you. I need you because I'm needy. Right? Who else? Who else in the world wears clothes? <laughs> well, I mean, there are people who put clothes on their dogs. Like, they're idiots. <laughs> okay, okay, that doesn't leave the room. Like, like, like okay, okay. I'm, I'm, I'm sure people here put clothes on their dogs. But I mean, come on, people. I mean, they're not asking for the coat. They've got one already. <laughs> but, but you know, but you know what I mean? Like, but why do we need clothes? Like, we need clothes because we're naked. We need clothes because we are, like, look, it's not a matter of choosing to be vulnerable. Like, we are vulnerable. The most powerfully beautiful things, the most durable things, the most reliable, ongoing things that we ever make, we make in the context of being vulnerable and where shame does not get to be part of the conversation. This is what the second chapter of Genesis is referring to. At the very end of the chapter, the writer says, and the first couple were naked and unashamed. They could have, the Jews could have said lots of things. They could have said they were naked and happy. I'm sure he was. They were naked <laughs> and all kinds of things. Right? They could, have said, they could have said they were naked and fearless. They were naked and all range of things. Right? But they didn't. They were naked and they were unashamed. Because in some way, in some way what we're seeing, what we're seeing in this space is who we all are. We are people of vulnerability. And it is in that place where I come to you in my vulnerability and say to you, this is where I'm weak, this is where I'm broken, this is where I don't know what I'm talking about. And in the course of my not knowing what I'm talking about, are you going to still be in the room when I'm done? <coughs> I hope to God that you are. Uh, you may have just answered my question, but uh, my name is Nikki, um, and an incredible woman, um, Melody Reese, who my husband and I saw um, before. Holy mackerel. <laughs> before, <laughs> when we went to your practice for pre-engagement counseling, yeah. um, she said one of the biggest takeaways, something we still talk about, is there's nothing more lonely than being physically present but emotionally unavailable. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know that for... A lot of people here in this room or just in general, we can think that, oh, because they have a spouse or because they have that, they have someone there who they have that connection with. But in reality, if they're emotionally unavailable, they can still be physically present, but it can be more lonely and isolating. So what are like practical first steps if that's not been something that's like a rhythm or um, like oh, something that usually happens in that relationship? What are just practical first steps to create that? Thank you. You're very welcome. And... Um, that three-hour answer will take place uh, after we're done. Dan, we're not leaving until midnight. Right. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this, um, that, again, the healing of shame, right, the antidote to evil, first and foremost, um, is to be found in the notion of let us make mankind in our image, and it's not good for man to be alone. That's where it begins from a Christian anthropology perspective, if you're, if you're going to ask me that question. Other people may have a different answer. But I'm also going to suggest that um, what's really important is that we are seeking out friendships in which we are deeply known in those friendships. 
And this takes risk and it takes courage and it often takes trial and error. Um, there is a guy uh, by the name of Paul Borgman and he wrote a book called Genesis, The Story We Haven't Heard. And Borgman is a professor of literature at a place called Gordon College. And every year he teaches this course on Genesis as, Genesis as a literature course. And um, in this he tackles three characters. If you've heard about these characters before, you might be familiar with this. He, ca he tackles Abraham, he tackles Jacob, and he tackles Joseph. And in his story about Abraham, he says this. He said, like, the God of the Bible is a God who loves partnerships. You know, God could have like, gone to Canaan on his own. Why don't you just go and start your own family? <laughs> he could have done that. But God is serious about partnering with people. And then Borgman asks this question. Who knows how many people God tried to partner with before Abraham finally agreed to the task? Who knows? Practicing being in relationships. When you say about first steps... I would say this, is there one person in your life that you would be willing to risk doing the following thing? Would you be willing to risk saying, look, um, tomorrow I'd like to take half an hour and either you or I start this process and I want you to tell me everything that you can tell me about yourself in 30 minutes, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And you're like, are you talking to me? <laughs> right? Because this is a scary thing to do. And then I would like to go next and do the same thing. Are you with me? This is frightening to do, but in the course of doing this, you give yourself the practice of what it means to be known by others. And then if you've done this, then you invite a third party to come. And if you've done then you invite a fourth party to come. And in so doing, you build communities of goodness and beauty. You operate out of a space of vulnerability in which shame is not allowed to be part of the conversation. Now, this is going to sound like completely self-serving. Utterly self-serving. One way to do this, get two other friends, buy my book on shame, and walk through the chapter questions at the end. Because those, like quite seriously, those, I know it sounds so mercenary, doesn't it? Those, but I'm not ashamed. So those things, I have no shame about selling. Okay. Those questions are intended to actually look at the very things that we have to contend with around your questions. So asking people, telling your story, inviting them to tell you theirs. Three steps. Kurt, we have uh, time for one more question and half of an answer. <laughs> so, whoever's willing to get half an answer. Uh. Oh, oh. You, you get to decide. I've got men here, men here. And that young lady, she stood hey, up hey, and then, well, I don't, you decide. I'm not, it's not my, I'm, my, I'm no. I'll let the three of you decide who gets to ask the uh, question. Yeah. Uh, uh, no. I answers, saw you first. Heads or tails? You got a coin? <laughs> Go ahead. I know you. <laughs> I think mine's going to be short. Your question's pretty short? Because I'm not going to ask for definition. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. yeah, we have okay. time for one question. Okay, I'm Jim. One thing that interests me, how would you differentiate shame from guilt? question is, how do we differentiate shame from guilt? Um, we, would, we tend to do that literally um, neurophysiologically and neurodevelopmentally. How do we do that? Um, we, one thing that we said was that shame starts early. Our experience of shame neurobiologically starts early. Guilt, as it turns out, or the thing that we call guilt, the phenomenon that we experience that we call guilt, isn't something that really starts to show up in children until they're somewhere between the ages of about three and five years of age. And now why is that? There's some presumptions about that. One is that the phenomenon of guilt includes a couple of features that shame doesn't include. One of those being that I not just am bad, but I've done something bad. I'm not bad, but I've done something bad, number one. And not only have I done something bad, but the thing that I've done wrong actually affects somebody else in my life. It affects a relationship. Now, I feel guilty because like, I've disappointed my dad, my mom, my teacher, my whoever, whatever, whatever that is. But both of those features, that I've done something bad and that I've done something that hurts somebody else, 
actually requires a developmental capacity on my part to separate me from the thing I've done and from the person I've hurt. It's generally considered that children younger than about three years of age, some might be able to do it younger than this, aren't really able to conceptualize that. Everything about their brain experience is about them. The sense that I can separate me from the thing I've done and or from other people is difficult for me to do. There's also some other interesting data about guilt, though. We know that when you experience the thing that, you call, that we call guilt, that physiologic neuro, uh, neuro um, we might say neuro-imagined experience, like I imagine people, I imagine what this is like. When I imagine this, people who experience guilt, especially if this happens between them and somebody that they trust, right? So they've hurt their parent or they've hurt their teacher or somebody else, the first thing that they tend to do is they tend to turn toward the person. They tend to turn toward the person, seek them out, and do something to ask for forgiveness, to seek reconciliation. This is what they tend to do, whether they're 5, whether they're 15, whether they're 25 years of age. This is what we tend to do. When we feel guilt, and we have been, and, and this has happened in a relationship in which we trust them, we tend to turn toward them in order to reconcile. With shame, we won't do it. Shame consistently is something in which we still turn away from someone. You do something, you hurt somebody's feelings, you apologize, they forgive you, and the next day you wake up and you still feel bad, that's not feeling guilty, that's shame. That's this sense that there is this residue, that there's something about me that's wrong. Not just that I've done something wrong, but I am wrong. That's difficult for us to get our hands around. And this is again why it's so crucially important for us to recognize that we live in a world that is increasingly coming apart at the seams. Sociologically. Fewer and fewer institutions. People are leaving the church in droves. This is not just about the church. This is, just a, this is about all kinds of organizations. People don't work for companies for long periods of time. All this is symptomatic of communal fabric that is fraying. And shame will be much more easily sustainable when I'm not in a communal relationship that I can continually, confidently, and predictably be able to move and live and have my being on a regular basis wherein which this can be healed. And I think I'll stop with that. Thanks very much. Thanks.